Yeah, so, okay, so let me not erase this for now. Uh, so today, I'll start with, so the first lecture um, will be an introduction to hyperbolic geometry, okay, so... Um, Um, so that's the goal for um, today, and um, more specifically, I'll be only looking in dimension two. Although I'll, I'll say some things about what happens for sort of general dimension uh, at the very end. Okay, and um, so hyperbolic geometry is something you might have already heard about, or uh, you know the existence of the hyperbolic plane. Uh, it's an example of, of non-Euclidean geometry, right? So it's, it's as a set or as a, uh, as a space, it's, it's like the, uh, you know, the usual plane, but uh, and you can talk of sort of points and lines and distances and angles and so on, like you do in Euclidean geometry, but it's, it's not the Euclidean geom geometry, and, and we'll see uh, the ways in which it differs today. Um, and sort of historically, it arose as an example which kind of obeys a certain set of axioms of Euclidean geometry, but not um, um, not others. But uh, it it uh, not is not only you know in an effort to come up with something some geometry which is different from Euclidean geometry, but it, it turns out it's very useful. It's useful in in physics. It comes up very naturally, and you know you talk of you know Minkowski space and so on, which. Uh, uh, you'll get to hear in this uh, few days, um, and it's, uh, the theory of relativity. So it's useful uh, there, and it's useful in mathematics also. I mean, so it's uh, in, when you talk of the geometry and topology of surfaces and of, of two manifolds and of three manifolds, it, it plays hyperbolic geometry plays an important role. Okay, so um, so uh, I'll, I'll say more about why we look at hyperbolic geometry at the end, but let's sort of start describing some um, models, you know, so some descriptions of what this hyperbolic plane looks like. So the first model I'll talk about uh, of the hyperbolic plane is the upper half plane model, okay? So, um, and we'll see two more models and we see why they are all kind of useful in their own way, okay? So the upper half plane model here you look at the set. So as a set, it's just the set of points on the complex plane which, where the imaginary part is bigger than zero. Okay? Um, and you can... Um, so here's the picture. So it's just sort of things above the real axis, if you like. Um, and this, you know, you can think of this as a subset of the complex plane. Okay? So, so a little bit of complex analysis enters the picture. So this is one feature of hyperbolic geometry that you'll see instances of. Uh, so, in, in, so when you talk of surfaces, I mean, this is a subject where... I mean, so, so geometry and complex analysis and, and groups, they all sort of come together, and there's a lot of interaction between these. And we'll see uh, such interaction in the next couple of lectures also. So, um, so as a complex... Um, Theoretical cancer is a domain in the complex plane. So there are a couple of facts which um, let me remind you. So the first of all is the automorphisms of the upper half plane is the group PSL2R. So automorphisms are just biholomorphisms of the upper half plane to itself. Okay, so an automorphism is a map which is analytic or holomorphic, or whatever you would call it, and its inverse is also holomorphic, okay? So that's a biholomorphism, and these automorphisms form a group, because you can compose, you know, and so on, and, and each are invertible. So an automorphism um, forms a group, and, and so the fact one is that the group automorphisms is this matrix group, okay? And what is this? Well, an automorphism is always of the form And this is an exercise in complex analysis. An automorphism of the upper half plane to itself is a linear fractional transformation. Okay, so it, it looks like this, okay, um, where A, B, C, D are real numbers. Okay, um, 
And, and there's a corresponding matrix, right? So there's a matrix. You can write this as A, B, C, T, just a two by two matrix. Okay, and it turns out that you, compositions of these maps are nothing but matrix multiplication here, right? So, so this, is, this is the map between you know, automorphisms on this side and, and the matrices on the other. And in fact, you want them to be biholomorphisms, so you want these matrices to be invertible. And so you can, so the determinant, you want it to be non-zero, but you can scale so that the determinant is one, okay? Uh, the scaling is, is something which contributes to this letter P here. So, it, so if you replace A, B, C, D with some, let's say, two times A, two times B, two times C, two times T, then this ratio doesn't change, right? So, um, so it gives you the same map. So as a, as a group, this is, uh, you have to projectivize, okay? So, um, so that, that's the relation between automorphisms and this group of matrices. And we'll come back to this uh, again and again in these lectures, okay? So, so that's fact one. Okay, so fact two, and this is really the starting point of the connection with sort of geometry and complex analysis, is that there is a unique Riemannian metric on H2 that is invariant under these automorphisms. Unique up to scaling, but I'll just say unique. Um, and this metric, so as, as you might have guessed, is a hyperbolic metric. Okay, so um, what does this look like? Well, so if you write it in these uh, complex coordinates, uh, this is the, what the metric looks like. Okay, so. Um, um, so if you if you don't like Z and you prefer X and Y coordinates, then you can convert this. So you can use Z is X plus I Y. So D Z is D X plus I D Y. So if you let me treat them as you know complex numbers and and then do the conversion, you get it's the usual Euclidean metric D X squared plus D Y squared divided by Y squared. Okay. So so Y is the sort of the height is the imaginary component of whatever place you are. Right? So this is the hyperbolic metric. Um, so why is this invariant under these automorphisms? Under, you know, so if you um, compose with this, well, so let me, let me show this. Um, so why is invariant? Well, what do you have to check? You have to check, so here's your um, map A, let's say, uh, which is one of these fractional linear transformations that takes the upper half plane to itself. So um, if you take a point Z0, that maps somewhere, so let's say A of Z0. So to check that the, it's, the metric is actually invariant, well, clearly, I mean, it's a conformal map, so angles don't change, okay? so. Um, what you need to check is that length of vectors. So suppose you have a tangent vector here and the tangent space at Z0. Uh, so suppose that tangent vector um, pushes forward to some ta another tangent vector. You want to s uh, say that the length of these tangent vectors are the same, right? So, um, so in other words, so what's the, what's, the, uh, what's the relation between the Xi and Xi prime? Well, if you look at the derivative, of A at the point Z0, that goes from the tangent space at Z0 to the tangent space at A of Z0, right? And, and so the, so Xi prime is the image. So this is a linear map. So you look at where this Xi goes, okay? So that's, that's where this vector goes. And you have to check that, so you want to check that this is it actually preserves the metric that this uh, distance preserving. You want this at an infinitesimal level. You want that the norm of xi in this hyperbolic metric, so let me just say hyperbolic, equals norm of xi prime in the hyperbolic metric, right? So this is what you need to check. Well, um, this you can compute, so let me just tell you the essential bits of this computation. So, well, uh, so 
you can check. So to compute derivative, you, ac you actually need to so look at this expression of A and, and compute the derivative of A with respect to Z. This you can do. This is just a, a simple exercise. And you can, you can check that if you take the derivative with respect to Z, you actually get something like this. There's a little bit of cancellation that happens, okay, because you take AD minus BC equals 1. Um, and you can also check that the imaginary part of A, A of Z Okay, so is equal to um, imaginary part of Z divided by um, absolute value CZ plus D squared. Okay, so this is an exercise, so it's a sort of an, uh, manipulating complex numbers. So once you have these, you can check this pretty easily. So what happens? So, so on this side, so this is, um, let's see, so... What's the hyperbolic norm of this vector? Well, you are at z naught, right? So, so this um, the metric is is um, this, the square of the norm is has this term imaginary by z squared in the denominator. So, so what you get is that this hyperbolic norm is the is the usual Euclidean norm of this complex number, which is namely the absolute value divided by the imaginary part of z naught. Okay, so that's the norm on this side. Whereas here, you can use these calculations. So, so xi prime is nothing but this times xi, where z is z naught, okay? So, um, so you get z, so, so this is nothing but xi prime divided by imaginary of a of z naught, but this is nothing but, um, so xi prime is xi times 1 upon cz0 plus d squared, okay? And then, but, um, but then you divide by the imaginary part of, so, you can, so it, that gives you imaginary of z0, cz0 plus d squared. And, and these cz0 plus d squared cancels out, and you so really see that these are equal, okay? So, so okay. Um, Anyway, so, yes. Yeah. Okay, it's possible. I mean, but here you have to take a derivative. These are, these are really different calculations, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, so, you, right, so this is not too hard. I mean, you can do it in various ways, okay? So, um, right, so it's actually an invariant, and you can actually see that, uh, leave that to you to figure out, that this, uh, this is the unique metric up to scaling that, uh, that is an invariant under automorphisms, okay? And it's quite a coincidence that such a thing exists at all. Is, uh, a priori, there's no reason why, you know, something is invariant under complex automorphisms should have some Riemannian metric that is invariant, but in this case, luckily for us, it does. And this metric has many nice properties, okay? So um, let me talk a little bit about properties of the hyperbolic metric. So first of all, um, so geodesics, which are the analog of straight lines, are... Um, so, uh, what, what are all the geodesics in the upper half plane? Um, so, so, vertical lines, it's not hard to see, are, are geodesics, okay? So, um, why? Because so suppose you take a vertical line. So, um, geodesics are, are the shortest path between pairs of points, right? So, those, so those give you sort of paths of geodesics, and yes, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, yeah, but I left it as a something to figure out. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so vertical lines are indeed the shortest path. If you, if you take two points, uh, let's say I, I times A and I times B that are on the same vertical line, then um, 
it's not too hard to convince yourself that the best way, the shortest way to go from here to there is in the vertical direction. Okay? So because if you deviate from this you know, straight and narrow and kind of go somewhere else, then you'll pick up your, your path that you pick will have some tangent direction with, with an x component, but that will contribute to this uh, dx squared term. Okay? And you'll necessarily have to add that when you're computing the length. Okay, so so that path cannot be the sort of the least um, uh, uh, sort of length path. So the shortest path has to be something that goes straight up. Okay, so if you're going, so that that kind of argument tells you that vertical lines are indeed geodesics. What else? Well, you know, so we've seen that all these images, uh, so that these uh, these um, uh, these uh, linear fractional transformations, they are 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 uh, maps that preserve the metric, they are automorphisms uh, that preserve the metric, and they are isometries. So, in the images of these vertical lines, right, so images of the vertical lines under elements of PSL2R, or these fractional linear transformations, preserving the upper half plane, um, so these would also be geodesics, okay? And then these, you have maybe seen what they are. So if you map uh, the upper half plane to itself by one of these linear fractional transformations, then of course the real line is preserved, and infinity might map to somewhere on the real line. But it also preserves, sort of, so circles go to circles, right? That's one of the properties of these Mobius transformations. So, so in particular, where do these lines go? These go to semicircles, which are centered at the uh, on the real line. Okay, so, so the semicircles which are perpendicular to this uh, real axis. Okay, so these would would all be sort of geodesics. Okay, um, so these are sort of uh, semicircle, semicircular arcs centered on R. Okay, um, so these are all uh, geodesics. As a consequence, there are a couple of immediate consequences. Um, so first of all, you see that any pair of points is uh, connected by a geodesic and by a unique one. This is a nice property to have. It tells you that it's a geodesic metric space and so on. So why is this true? Well, so if you take a couple of points in the hyperbolic plane, it's, it's not too hard to construct um, a semicircle, right, which, which has center on the real axis and passes, passes through these two points. Okay, so it's now it's, a, it's an exercise in Euclidean geometry, right? So, of course, they could also lie on the same vertical line, in which case you're also done, okay? Um, yeah, and it's also unique. Um, second sort of consequence is uh, sort of uh, I'll just mention for its historical significance. So, um, um, so the what is called the parallel axiom fails. Okay, so um, so in Euclidean geometry, if you look at a at a straight line, I mean, um, then and you pick a point outside it, right? So then there's a, a unique line which passes through that point and doesn't intersect this given line. Okay, so um, so here, so here's your um, vertical geodesic. That's the analog of a straight line in hyperbolic on the hyperbolic plane. If you pick a point outside it, there's obviously some geodesic you can draw, and you can draw lots of them. Okay, so. So there are infinitely many of them that you can sort of come up with. They're all semicircles perpendicular to the boundary, so they are all geodesics, and they all disjoint from this one. Okay. Um, so for a while, um, yeah. So uh, there's some historical context in which this was looked at, right? So for a while, people were trying to prove that the parallel axiom actually follows from the other axioms of Euclidean geometry, but this. Example tells you it doesn't, okay, because hyperbolic geometry satisfies the other Euclidean axioms, um, except this one, okay? So, um, 
Yeah, so this is uh, another thing that you can sort of see once you know what the geodesics are. Okay, so, okay, so that's one property. Another property, sort of in the same, along the same lines, is that this metric, this hyperbolic metric that we've defined on the upper half plane, is complete. Okay? Um, so you've, you've probably learned several notions of completeness, the completeness of metric spaces where Cauchy sequences converge and so on. So in Riemannian geometry, there's an equivalent I mean, definition that something as a Riemannian you know, so a manifold is complete if you can continue geodesics for all time. Okay, so if you look at these uh, length-minimizing paths and you parameterize them by arc length, you can keep going so along such a geodesic, and you never hit a boundary in finite time. Okay, so over here, these vertical geodesics, for instance, you might, you know, sort of um, worry that these, you know, so this this, this boundary of upper half space you reach and, you know, sort of this geodesic comes and hits as you keep walking at, let's say, unit speed, you come and hit this boundary and, and then you're not complete. But that doesn't happen. And you can check. I mean, so, so if you pick uh, so two points, let's say, I mean, we had picked some points before, let's say I, B and I, A, um, then um, the distance between this is log b by a, okay? So this is just by computing this integral. So here what matters is so the lengths of vectors are in this y direction, right? So, so this dx doesn't matter. So if you integrate the length of a vector, which is dy by y, you get this log, okay? And, um, and so this distance that you integrate from a to b, you get exactly this. And, and indeed, so as a goes to zero, right, this distance blows up. Okay, so you, you, this, this is actually, this boundary is actually at infinite distance. So you'll never reach it if you are walking at unix, unit speed along this geodesic. And the same holds for all these geodesics. These are all uh, isometric to each other, right? So, um, so this metric is complete. And, and in fact, the, and, and so this real axis together with infinity, okay? So it, this forms a circle, actually. So this is the boundary at infinity. Okay? So this is what is called the boundary at infinity. And we'll, we'll come sort of refer to it as the boundary at infinity. Okay? Um, uh, let's see. So, so, yeah, so this actually gives you the expression for the distance between two points on a vertical uh, line. And if you want uh, an expression just for completeness, let me tell you what the distance between two arbitrary points is. So, so if you have two points on the hyperbolic plane, okay, so the way to compute the distance would be to, to look for the circle, semicircle that passes these two, and you can, can map that circle to this vertical axis by a Mobius transformation, right? And on the vertical axis, you know how to compute the distance. And so you can compute the distance between two points. But when you kind of uh, convert it to um, some um, to, to some formula, so you'll get something like this. So the distance, this is the hyperbolic distance between Z and W. Uh, the cosh of this distance is 1 plus... Some of you know this formula. Um, so this is it's this one, I think. So. Um, so this this is a way to calculate. So you must check that this agrees for these two, like, you know, so this pair. But anyway, so the, so, um, so you can prove this. I mean, so uh, so the left hand side is invariant under SL2, or so is the right, and that's a good check to do. And, and so this turns out to be a distance formula. So uh, so for, uh, for, for points or for a pair of points in the hyperbolic plane. Okay. Um, all right, so, so, so much the tricks, and let's, let's turn to another way that it's slightly different from um, Euclidean geometry. So the third kind of curious property is that um, the sum of interior angles of any geodesic triangle is less than pi, okay? So, 
Um, so in Euclidean geometry, you're quite familiar with the property that if you take a tr triangle, uh, geodesic just means that the sides are all straight lines, uh, geodesics. Um, and you look at these interior angles, then, um, so in Euclidean geometry, the sum of these is exactly pi, right? So always. But in hyperbolic geometry, um, it's, it's not. So what does a triangle in a hyperbolic plane look like? Well, so let's draw a, a triangle. So remember that you want the sides to be parts of geodesics. So, well, you can take one side to be along the vertical line. So that's the geodesic direction. And you can sort of continue along some semicircular arc. Okay, so it's part of a semicircle that is centered on the real axis. So that's, suppose, another side, and you stop somewhere, and then you take another semicircular arc that joins these two. So maybe the, the yeah, so perhaps the um, triangle looks like this. So maybe there are these three interior angles. And, um, and if, you, if you stare at this picture, you'll, you'll kind of notice that the sum of these angles is, is actually less than pi. Because the angles in hyperbolic geometry, by the way, is the same as what you see when I draw it in the upper half plane. Okay? It's an example of a conformal model of, of, the hyperbolic, of hyperbolic geometry. It's a, uh, the, the, um, the difference between Euclidean, the Euclidean metric is just a conformal factor. Okay? So that doesn't change the angles. So, so indeed, these angles uh, uh, in, hyperbolic, in a hyperbolic geodesic triangle are strictly less than pi. And one extreme example, another example, so here has one picture. Another example is what is called an ideal triangle. Okay, so here's so extreme example of this. So if you look at a, geodes a triangle with an infinite geodesic side, namely one of these vertical geodesics, which we've seen has infinite length, and let's say its end point is zero, and you have another semicircular arc which connects to one, and then you have one of the, another infinite geodesic. So here, this describes a triangle. Here are three sort of geodesic sides, okay? And, but this time, the vertex, the vertices of the triangles are at the bound at infinity, okay? So these, so zero, one, and there's another one at infinity. So these are uh, vertices which are at infinity. So these are what are called ideal vertices. Okay, so that ideal triangle, and, and what happens here is that here the angles are, are zero, right? Because here, so this semicircular arc is actually tangent to this line. Okay, so, so if you look at uh, how these tangent vectors, they, they align as you go to this vertex. So here the interior angles are actually zero, okay? Um, and this, uh, this picture, you can, uh, although this is, these vertices are not in the hyperbolic plane, but you can pick triangles inside the hyperbolic plane which kind of converge to this kind of ideal picture, right? So, um, so the, the interior angles can be arbitrarily small, not just less than pi, they can be really small. Okay? So, um, so this is a curious fact. In fact, um, what one can show, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's also going to go to zero, right? So even this one. So, so actually, so these points you can permute by by a linear tra tra fractional transformation, right? You by an isometry. So you can just take infinity to zero if you want, and that's going to preserve. So the picture that you see here is also the picture at infinity, right? So, um, okay. So how do you um, see this? So, so in fact, you can we, we can prove something stronger. So. Um, so in fact, what you can, we can show something stronger, which is that the area of a geodesic triangle, I'll just, um, so let me just call it something, it's a sort of triangle with these interior angles alpha, beta, gamma. So this just means that it's a geodesic triangle with interior angles alpha, beta, and gamma. So the, the area of this triangle is pi minus alpha minus beta minus gamma. 
Okay, so this is uh, something like this is n definitely not true for Euclidean geometry, right? So, um, but it is true here in hyperbolic geometry. And one way to do this is to um, is to use this upper half plane model to actually compute the area. Okay, so so let's see how this is done. So so um, yeah, so um, yeah, may maybe I'll just sort of at least sort of sketch the way that one might prove this. Um, so what do you have to do? So here's your triangle. Let, let's draw that same picture here. Um, so you have a triangle with... Um, so let's, let's do it for a triangle where one of the angles is zero. So this triangle, zero, or let's say alpha, beta, zero. Okay, so suppose this is alpha and this is beta. It looks close to 90 degree, but maybe it's not. Okay, and, and the other one is zero. Okay, so, so I want to show that the area of this is, well, it's pi minus alpha minus beta. So what do you have to do? So the area of this is, uh, you have to do this double integral of the area element. So in the Riemannian geometry, once you have a Riemannian metric, you can form the area element. So it's sort of the length of two infinitesimal vectors, right? So x and y, and you compute the, um, so the length of that, or the area of the infinitesimal par parallelogram, and you integrate over, over this. So if you want to do this integral, so, so actually here, so maybe it's uh, kind of useful to, so remember this is part of a semicircular arc. So instead of x and y, I'm going to use this, so this sort of theta and y. Okay, so theta is this coordinate that goes, so it's just like polar coordinates. Okay, so theta is the angle from the x-axis. So if x is, let's say, some r naught, um, yeah, so sine theta, so this is our r naught, then sort of dx is, um, sorry, this is maybe cosine theta, and this, this is sine dx is r naught, sine theta d theta. So what you have to do here is integral. Uh, its integral becomes, well, its theta varies from alpha to pi minus beta. Okay, so you can you can you can you can check. Okay, so these are um, so these are vertical lines, right? So um, right, so this angle is pi minus beta, and and this integral now so so that that's the x as well. Now that's the theta direction, and and there's a dy, um, and you're dividing by y squared. So x I've kind of uh, I'll convert to this r naught sine theta d theta, um, and dy by y squared, and now this, so let me just write it here. So, so r naught sine theta. Um, so that's what the area element now, and, and this uh, y now varies from, well, if you're here, it's r naught, it's at height r naught sine theta, um, uh, so at any angle, so that's the height. And you're going from there to infinity. So it's the integral from r naught sine theta to infinity. Okay, so that, that's what this area integral becomes. Okay, and it's easy to now see. So, okay, so what, how, what do you do? Well, this r naught sine theta, you do this dy first, right? So um, then you should get, yeah, so, so what happens? So phi minus beta, r naught sine theta comes out here. And you do this integral of dy by y squared from r naught sine theta to infinity. Do this first and then do d theta. And you should get phi minus alpha minus beta. Okay, so I'll leave that to you to check. Okay, so, so, so what happens here? This is just minus 1 upon y from r naught sine theta to infinity. So so this cancels out, this R0 sine theta cancels. So you get, get the integral of 1 from alpha to pi minus beta, and that just gives you this, okay? So, so you know how to do this area, and this, from this, this follows, because suppose you have a triangle with... Um, yeah, so suppose you have... So, uh, so triangle in the hyperbolic plane with, uh, with three 
angles, none of which are zero. So it's not a, any, this doesn't have any ideal vertex. Well, you can, you can um, make it part of a bigger triangle where you, this is an ideal, well, it has one ideal vertex at infinity. This is one ideal vertex at infinity. You've, you, this formula tells you how to calculate this area and this area, right? And also tells you how to calculate um, this area, right? So there's another ideal triangle, which is this. And, and if you sort of add these two and subtract this, you should get this area of, of this triangle. And if you could plug this in here uh, using just the formula that we got for this alpha beta zero case, you should get the general case. Okay, that's, that's a sort of a simple trick. Okay, so it's enough to do this case. Okay, so, okay, so this is one kind of curious um, property of, of uh, the hyperbolic uh, plane, the hyperbolic metric. The final property um, that I want to mention which is related to this is the fact that well, maybe this is the fourth one, right? So it's one, yeah, so it's the fourth property. Yeah, so the fourth property then is um, the fact that um, this metric, the hyperbolic metric, has, can anyone suggest a property that, well, uh, uh, can anyone suggest a property, the property I'm about to write down? I, mean, I can't not mention it, right? I mean, it's an important property. Maybe some of you already know. Uh, yeah. Do any of you? Okay, so, well, okay, so the hyperbolic metric has constant curvature. Minus one, okay, so it's a constant negative curvature. All right, so, yeah, so, so, you know, so if you're doing Riemannian geometry, this is one of the, sort of the important things about the hyperbolic metric. And, um, okay, so you've already kind of uh, seen some, um, sort of glimpse of what notion of a curvature is in the lectures today. Um, and it's something, some intuitive notion that even though you don't know, you haven't seen the definition, you kind of know what intuitively it is, right? So sphere you know is sort of is um, positively curved and the flat plane um, so it's positively curved constant positive curvature everywhere the flat plane is zero and you know that things like if it has a, if there's a saddle then at this point this curvature is, is negative right so and but all of these of course depend on you know how this these surfaces sit in r3 but as uh, as you have been um, sort of starting to learn this, the curvature is actually an intrinsic property, okay? So you don't need to look at how the surface is embedded in R3 to compute the curvature. In fact, one way that uh, the curvature can be computed is that it's, it's sort of the deviation from being flat, right? So, so, um, so one way is the following, it's the limit. So it's, it's, it's um, you, can, you can see it as the rate at which, you know, sort of um, the area of disks grow. So it, you know that in Euclidean geometry, if you look at a disk of radius r, okay, so this radius is computed in the metric, in, in the Euclidean metric. So this disk area r, uh, you know the formula, it's pi r squared, right? So on the, in the same thing in the round metric on the sphere, you look at a disk of spherical radius r, it turns out that the area r is, is less than pi r squared, okay? So, so if you go for the, I mean, these, um, yeah, so this is, there's a bulge, right? So, so you expect at every point, if you compute, if you go out a distance r, you sweep out an area, a, a, a disk of radius r, the area of the distance are to be less than pi r squared, and, um, well, in a negative curvature, one way of measuring curvature is this deviation from pi r squared, okay? So, in, in particular, sorry? No, it's, it's less than, okay, so, um, yeah, 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 it's, 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 uh, so in general, it's, it's this, so it's, uh, if you look at the area of R, look at the deviation from pi R squared, and it's a fourth order thing, it's a, 
if you divide by pi r to the 4, okay, and multiply by 4, this actually gives you the Gaussian curvature of at, at the point. Okay, so this is all at a point. Okay, you look at sort of disks growing okay, of a certain radius. And, and this, so if you compute it for the hyperbolic plane, and we'll do it, um, it's, it's this... Oh, sorry, uh, this is, uh, is this something? Okay, maybe it's, uh, yeah, it's sort of, it's pi r square, right, sorry, yeah. It's, it's this, perhaps, yeah. Okay, thank you, yeah. All right, so the first positively curved, it then needs to be less than pi r square. Okay, um, yeah. We, and we, we want to see this for the hyperbolic plane. Okay, let's we'll, we'll compute this, and the best way to complete, compute this would be in the in the disk model. Okay, so let's now move on to the disk model. So the, so each model has its advantages. So uh, one of the uh, disadvantages of, of the hyperbolic plane is not it's not clear that it's sort of rotationally symmetric. But that's sort of um, sorted out in this disk model. So the second model of the of hyperbolic plane is just the unit disk okay um, the unit disk in the complex plane now you look at all points um, absolute value less than one uh, again this is part of a complex plane as familiar um, kind of shape um, now this uh, you can the hyperbolic metric that the metric that makes it the hyperbolic plane is uh, now looks like this so it's the usual euclidean um, uh, metric and then you multiply by four and you divide by this five. so again a conformal metric okay um, and if you, if you write it in um, x and y coordinates it looks like this this is the dx squared plus dy squared usual euclidean metric you multiply by four and there's a x squared minus y squared squared. Okay, so, okay, so it looks something like this. Now this is actually is the same as the upper half plane. So there's a map from the upper half plane to the unit disk, which you can write down. So there's, there's several such maps, but you can take, for example, so from H2 to D, um, you can take a map that the Z goes to Z minus I upon z plus i okay so um, if you look on the ha upper half plane then i is up there so any point so the distance from i is certainly less than the distance from minus i so this you land in the unit disk okay and and in fact you can show that this is um well this is a, a biholomorphic map so there's a, uh, this is a mobius transformation so you can, can compute its inverse and this um is an isometry, okay? It preserves the metric. It takes the hyperbolic metric that we've seen already on the upper half plane. It takes it to uh, this metric here, okay? So, um, and this again, I'll leave the calculation to you. It's very similar to what we did before. So you have to check that. Um, so what do you have to check? So if you are at a point in um, on the upper half plane, so. By the way, where does uh, the point I map to? Well, the I maps to the center of the disk. Okay, so um, and on the bo the boundary maps to the boundary of the cir of the circle, right? So zero, for example, if you plug in zero here, you get minus one. So that goes to minus one. Okay, um, and where does infinity go? Infinity goes to to um, so one, right? So infinity goes to one. So somehow this uh, this ray kind of um, wraps around this way, and this yeah, wraps around this way. One of the two, right? So so your yeah, boundary goes to uh, the boundary of the uh, of the disk, um, and and so so maybe this point goes somewhere here. So to check that this is an isometry, you have to check that once again, as before, you take a tangent vector here and you look to compute. The derivative. So this is phi of z. You have to look where xi, what xi prime is. Okay. So you have to check that um, 
the norm of, of this xi in the hyperbolic metric on the upper half plane equals this norm of xi prime that you get if you compute the tangent uh, map and you look at the image of this xi under, this, under that linear map. So then it's the norm in this new metric on D that we've written down. Okay, so you can check this. That's again a calculation. You can use the same facts we used before to check that. Okay, so that, that's an isometry. So, so things you know about the hyperbolic metric now is goes passes here. Okay, so in, in particular, what happens to geodesics? So what are geodesics here? Well, there are images of geodesics here. So the, here we saw that the vertical line and all these semicircles were geodesics. So where do these go? Well, these vertical line goes to the, this diameter that goes from, yeah, passes through zero, right? So because i goes to zero, zero goes to minus one, infinity goes to one, so this line sort of maps to this line. And, and similarly, these, this is a Mobius transformation again, except now it has complex coefficients. But it has the same property that circles go to circles, right? So these semicircles go to semicircular arcs intersecting the boundary of the disk at right angles. Okay, so, so, so things that you knew about the hyperbolic plane here, you, you can now transfer it to things that you know about the disk model. Okay, so, um, so you know about geodesics now. So, but here, the disk model, the advantage is, as I said, that's quite clear from this expression that your metric is rotationally symmetric, right? So this is about this point zero, so there's some, some S1 worth of symmetries. You can rotate in a circle no matter where you kind of face as you stand here, you'll see the same thing, okay? So, so and you can compute things like areas of disks and so on. You can compute better in this picture, okay? So let me try to do that. Um, so compute the curvature by the, uh, this definition. So, yeah, so what does, so if you take, so let me draw this current disk again. So if you take a, um, a disk of Euclidean diameter r, okay, so the, after all this is a disk on the complex plane, right, you can look at the Euclidean metric. So, um, so a disk of Euclidean radius r has some hyperbolic radius. So, so since it's rotationally symmetric, this disk is also a hyperbolic disk. Okay, so it's a it's some you know disk in the hyperbolic metric. So this hyperbolic radius rho, where rho is so now you have to calculate, right? So what's this? If you go r here, what's this? hyperbolic distance, but that you can easily do using, well, one of these, right? So, so you have to integrate um, something, you have to, um, so suppose you, I mean, look at something like this, you have to, perhaps you have to integrate um, something that looks like this from um, zero to r. Right, and so what you get at the end of the day is uh, so this is how this uh, hyperbolic radius and Euclidean radius are related. Okay, um, and um, and if and in fact you can turn this around just so um, so so um, so so note that so this R in terms of rho is just uh, tan hyperbolic rho by 2. Okay, so, so this is just tan hyperbolic rho by 2. Okay? Um, and now what's the circumference then? So now if you, if you have a, a disk of hyperbolic radius rho, it has Euclidean radius r, which is this. Okay, so the circumference um, is, of course, again, so if you are at mod z equals r, the circumference is just, you know, so, um, so this times uh, r, so the circumference is, in terms of the Euclidean radius is just 2r times 1 minus squared, okay, because you're integrating some constant 
function. So maybe there's a 2 pi here. Uh, so maybe it becomes 4 pi. Right? So what's the circumference? Let's see. So, um, yeah. So, so, so you, so for every, so you kind of integrate this over a circle, right? So you get a 2 pi times the length of this. So you get, um, maybe I should write it as 2 pi times 2r. Um, so that's the circumference. Now if you want to express it in terms of rho, it turns out to be um, twice of sinh rho. So sorry, 2 pi times sinh rho. Okay? So that's the circumference. So now, what's the area? So the area of this disk, okay? Um, so this was the, so this is a disk of hyperbolic radius rho. So Euclidean radius r, so hyperbolic radius rho. So you know that its circumference is this, and you know that you get the area by sort of integrating from 0 to rho, the circumference that you get at every stage. Okay, so, the, so, so this will be an integral of 2 pi times sinh t dt from 0 to rho. Okay, and what you get here is, um, well, it's not, so this you can, sinh of t, you can, that gives you cosh, and then so you get cosh of rho minus 1. Okay, which is 4 pi times sinh squared of rho by 2. Okay, so this is some kind of just sort of playing around with the various trigonometric identities involving cosh and sinh. Okay, so, um, so this is the area. Now, we have to check that this kind of grows you know, faster than pi rho squared. Okay, so, so it's kind of, uh, so, you, so to do that you can expand out, so you can try to sort of look at the Taylor series expansion if you want. So, so what, does, what does sinh mean, by the way? So, so this means it's 4 pi, and sinh is just e to the uh, rho by 2, so it's sinh of rho by 2, minus 2 divided by 2, we're taking square, okay? And, well, so now it's just some high school arithmetic, so, you can, so this is e rho plus e minus rho, so this 4 cancels, right? So you get pi times e rho plus 2, expanding the square, and this you can compute, so it's, uh, so if you write down the sort of this Taylor series, it's this rho squared plus rho to the power 4 by 12 plus higher order terms involving rho. Okay, so you, you see now that the deviation from pi rho squared, okay, so now if you try to compute the curvature using this formula, deviation is exactly minus one, okay, so, uh, so it's, it's more than pi r rho squared, and the, the, by the factor by which it's more, the fourth order factor is minus one. So, so this is the calculation that tells you that at every point, um, so, so this was at zero, but but it's a property that every point can be taken to another point by a Mobius transformation, which you already know. So, so in fact, so at every point, this, the, the rate at which the, the area grows um, tells you that the curvature is exactly minus one. Okay, so everywhere. All right, so, so that's a computation that's sort of suited to this disk model. Okay. Um, yeah, so let me uh, sort of, um, yeah, so before I go on to the, the, the last model, the, um, the so-called hyperboloid model, let me uh, s so digress a bit and do s a little bit of hyperbolic trigonometry. So, um, uh, so something that you may be familiar with in Euclidean space. So as a warm-up, so, so let's uh, kind of try to see what's the analog of, the, of Pythagoras' theorem. So, so if you look at a 
uh, if you want a right angled triangle, triangles for us always have geodesic sides. Okay, so the geodesic triangle. Um, so what does it look like? Well, maybe in the in the picture I was drawing before in the upper half plane. So you want one of these angles to be 90 degrees. Okay, so pi by two and others, let's say alpha and beta. Uh, they have some side lengths. Let's say this is A, this is B, and this is C. Okay? So then, um, so this is a right angle triangle. Two with side lengths A, B, and C. Okay? So then, uh, um, it's a fact. So let's, let's see. Um, so, the, so the analog. So let me say. Well, it's, maybe it's a lemma. Um, but, uh, so then what's the relation between A and B? And see, the cosh of A is the simple one. It's cosh of A times cosh of B. That's the, the cosh of C equals cosh of B. Okay, so how do you see this? So, um, well, there are various ways of uh, proving this, but since I already mentioned this... Uh, Distance formula, right? So you can you can sort of label points here. So you can make these lie on a on a, on the vertical axis, right? So then what happens? So let's say this is I. Okay. Um, so then and this, what point should this be then? So this distance is A. Right. So sorry. I times e to the a. Yeah. So this distance would then be A. What point is this now? So suppose I, I mean, so I'm on this imaginary axis, right? Suppose this is 90 degrees. So the center of the semicircle is at zero, right? So, so, so a little bit of thought will tell you that this is, this is actually e to the i alpha, okay? So if we want this angle to be alpha, okay, so, so uh, this, this is e to the i alpha. So now we know you can sort of give addresses to these points. So you can use this distance formula that I wrote down to compute distances, and that is a sort of an easy way out. Okay, so so you can compute the distance. Let's say let's take these two points. So suppose you have this is a nice fact in hyperbolic geometry. If you look at some point here i, and some point on the same semicircle. I mean so. So you kind of rotate this, right, and go to e to the i alpha, right? So this, oh, uh, well, this is alpha, but but yeah. So um, yeah. So let's see. So if you look at, so this is also alpha, right? So so so. But if you forget this triangle, this is what this point turns out to be. What's the distance between this, these two? Okay. So so it turns out. So if you use the distance formula, so then what's the? You want to compute the distance between i and e to the i alpha, okay? That's our uh, side length b, okay? Um, so that's nothing but one, so sorry, so if, if you want, so that's our b, so if you want cosh of b, right? That's what the distance formula told you. So cosh of b is one plus, what was it? i minus i alpha um, squared divided by twice of imaginary of i times imaginary part of i alpha. Okay, so this was, uh, I'm just plugging in. Okay, so um, so this becomes, what does this become? Um, so what's this? Well, you have to kind of do some bit of complex analysis of, kind of manipulation of these terms. So in splitting into real and imaginary parts, perhaps. So here, I mean, so i, Alpha, remember, is always cosine alpha plus i times sine alpha, right? So, so, so can someone tell me? So what does this become? So this is just now 1 minus sine alpha squared plus cosine squared alpha. Imaginary part of i is just 1. Imaginary part of i, e to i alpha is just sine alpha. Okay, so you get something like this. Now this, if you expand and you add, um, should turn out to be just one upon the sign out. Okay. Does this work? I mean, this is some manipulation, right? So if you 
If you square this, there's a sine squared alpha, but that combines with cosine squared alpha to be one, right? So, and then you can see that if you add this, becomes sine alpha, okay? So at, le at least you know that this cosh B term is one upon sine alpha. Similarly, if you look at cosh of, uh, of A, which is this distance from I to I times E to the A, Using this distance formula, right, that we had before, you can, you, you can see that you'll see that you get um, 1 upon sine alpha. Um, sorry, uh, so maybe I don't want cosh of A. So cosh of A we already know, right? So you want cosh of C. So cosh of C is from E to the I alpha to i times e to the a. So you get 1 upon sine alpha times cosh of a. Okay? So this again by using the, so, so you can check this. Okay? So by, by using this distance formula. Okay? So, so these two together tell, gives us the, this lemma, right? So this 1 upon sine alpha is nothing but cosh of b, and you have a cosh of a. All right? So, um, so that's the analog of, of the Pythagoras theorem. And already you see some, one interesting thing, which is um, note that in Euclidean geometry, so in Euclidean geometry, if you take a right-angled triangle, this is something that you've done quite a lot in high school. So you know that c squared is a squared plus b squared. Um, so then, if A and B are large, right, so quite large, then, then C is, is uh, quite l much larger than A plus B. Okay, this is some fact that you know uh, from real life experience, or if you want to cross a field, it's much better to do it diagonally, right? So, by hyperbolic geometry, this, you don't gain much. Okay, so, so what happens, so how, how far is... Uh, uh, C from A plus B. So if you compute, so, so let's try to compute. If you take cosh of A plus B, so some kind of standard formula in, in um, sort of hyperbolic trigonometry tells you that you have some kind of term like this. Um, now this, the second one is actually less than this, so you get less than cosh A and cosh B. And, and this, you've seen, is equal to twice cosh C by this lemma, um, which is in turn is less than cosh of C plus arc, arc cosh 2, okay? Because if you expand this, you'll get one of the terms is this. All right, so, so it implies that A plus B is less than C plus some constant, namely arc cosh of 2. Okay. So, it, so the C, you know, for a hyperbolic right angle triangle, if you cut across a diagonal, you at most gain this much. Okay? So, you won't, so you won't really gain much as in Euclidean geometry. Okay? So, um, so that's one kind of feature, and it's a, it's a, it's a case, a simple case of what a uh, general property of, of negatively curved Riemannian spaces, namely the, the triangles are thin. Okay, so so here, so if you make A and B large in Euclidean geometry, C becomes quite far away from these two sides. But that never happens in hyperbolic geometry. Your the third side always stays in some at some close distance to the other two sides of a geodesic triangle of any triangles. Okay, so that's um, sort of a sort of. Let me just comment that the general a feature of hyperbolic geometry and other sort of negatively curved spaces, so the triangles are thin. And, and this, this sort of tells you, uh, gives you an example of, of such a thing. Yes, yes, because, yeah, that's a feature that, again, it's kind of clearer in the disk model, right? In the disk model, remember what the metric was. The metric is four times the usual Euclidean metric divided by this. Now, if you're, if you're very close to the origin, then this term is very close to 1. 
So you are kind of four times the usual Euclidean metric. Okay, so you are almost you're flat. Okay, but not quite. I mean, so so it's still sort of curvature is uh, is negative, right? So okay. So it's so actually, by the way, so before I erase this, another fact, another sort of curious thing here. So if you call the circumference C rho, then you can notice that I mean I should have mentioned this earlier that that A rho by this ratio actually goes to one as rho goes to infinity. So for for large disks, for large hyperbolic disks, um, your your area is kind of concentrated near the boundary. So it's again very different from Euclidean space. So in Euclidean space, most of the area of a disk, of a large disk, is well, it's it's sort of it's spread over, but near the boundary is certainly less. Right? The boundary is sort of is like linear. Whereas the area is quadratic in R, right? But but here both are have kind of the same exponential behavior. This this ratio you can compute it goes to one. So so it kind of tells you that most of the area is is concentrated in the boundary. Okay. So um, yeah. So this was one kind of so this analog of of the Pythagoras theorem. Let me mention a few more formulae, which. Um, um, which can be easily okay. Let me not do that because I'm running out of time. So let me kind of just say that there are more general formula, a hyperbolic trigonometric formula for this was for a right-angled triangle, but if you look at sort of arbitrary triangles with some angles, so you can you can calculate there's some relation between the angles and the sides. Okay, and one of the features of hyperbolic Geometry is that the angles, the interior angles, actually determine the triangle up to isometry. So this is not true in Euclidean geometry, right? Because you have similar triangles, two triangles of this, the same interior angles, but which are not congruent to each other. They are, you can scale. In hyperbolic geometry, that does that doesn't happen. So if you know the angles of a, of a triangle, you can compute the lengths of the sides. You can compute the Triangle up to isometry. Okay, so the, so anyway, so I won't go into that. Although the proof of that is very nice in the hyperboloid model, which I'll come to now. So so um, maybe in the tutorial I'll sort of tell you about the other hyperbolic trigonometric formulae. Okay, so now let's turn to the hyperbolic hyperboloid model. This is the reason why it's called hyperbolic geometry. Actually, so so R three. So this time you look at R three with the pseudo-Riemannian metric um, given by the inner product. So the inner product of two vectors, let's say u and v, or let's say maybe x and y, um, is given by some um, quadratic form of signature 2, 1. Okay, so um, so this um, this is how you compute inner products now in this in this metric. So um, so in, in if in this uh, space uh, you take the set, let's call it script H. Um, let's give it some fancy lettering. Um, it's all the set of vectors in this R three with this funny way of measuring the norms, uh, such that um, the square of the norm of this uh, vector um, uh, of the inner product with itself is minus one, and you also want the last coordinate. So remember all these. Whenever I write something with an arrow, it really means x1, x2, x3, right? Something in so, so. So this last coordinate I want to be positive. Okay. So this is, this defines a set. What does this look like? Well, so. Um, Yeah, so, so let's, uh, what's the usual picture? You might have seen various versions of this at various points of time. So let's say this is a sort of x1, x2, and x3 directions. So then in, in this R3, there's a, there's, a, there's a cone where, I mean, so norms of vectors are zero, right? So if you look at any vector here, suppose your x, bar is, represents point 
on this uh, cone, so then, so this is zero. This is, of course, not never true in, in a usual Riemannian metric, right? But is, uh, that's why it's a pseudo-Riemannian metric. Um, so there's some cone here, and what does this set that I've described, what does this look like? Well, it turns out that this looks like a hyperboloid. Okay, so, well, um, yeah, well, I, I'll call it a hyperboloid. I don't, I don't remember what these things are called. But it's there, so if you look at this level set, the uh, vectors whose norm is minus one. So one example of such a point is, is zero, zero, 001, right? So if you look at the zero, zero, 001 inner product with itself in this funny inner product, then you get minus one, right? So this is certainly in this set. And in fact, there are two sort of components to the set, but we only so there's another sort of hyperbola down here, but you only consider the one which has x3 coordinate positive, okay? So you look at th this component, all right? So now, um, yeah, so that's the set. What is the metric? So I'm going to say that this script H, I'm writing H because that's actually secretly the hyperbolic plane, okay? So what's the metric? So the H is equipped with um, the metric, Induced by this inner product, so the claim. Oops. Um, so the so the metric induced on H, the script H, induced from um, R three with this funny metric um, is. Um, so how, many, how much time do I have? I've, okay. Um, is a Riemannian metric. Okay, so the first thing to check, of course, we started with something which is not a Riemannian metric. So if, but if you restrict to this, you know, sort of sub um, set, okay, so this is this some kind of sh shape here. If you look at a tangent space to any point here, then vectors in the tangent space to a point of this will, will acquire uh, an inner product just by restriction, right? Restricting the, the metric, the inner product on, the, on R3. And this um, inner product is actually a Riemannian metric. And you can see this, so for example, if you look at the tangent space at 0, 0, 001, okay? So that's your that's special point that you saw. If you look at the tangent space, what does the tangent space here look like? Well, well, from the picture, it's sort of clear that this is that actually a plane which is parallel to the x1, x2 plane. Okay, so so um, so that's sort of it's going to be identified with sort of x1, x2, zero. Okay, so so that's what the tangent space here looks like. And indeed, if you restrict your tangent space, if you restrict this inner product to some plane which is parallel to the x1, x2 axis, then tangent vectors you never see this x3. Term, right, so the last coordinate is always zero. So, so the here on this tangent space, of course, it's it's a, it's a Riemannian metric. Okay, um, but what about other points on this hyperboloid? Well, you can check this, and then the neatest way to check that this is indeed defines a Riemannian metric everywhere is to notice that there is a there's a group which acts transitively on this on this uh, subset script H, okay? So um, there's a group that acts by isometries, preserving this, uh, this, uh, this inner product. Okay, so this, this group is called SO21. So the group SO21, it's a, it's a three by three matrix now. So it's, it's uh, all these groups are uh, I'll take, um, so three by three matrices whose determinant is one. So that's SL3R. But I want this to preserve this funny inner product, right? So, so I want to say that the, if you look at the diagonal matrix one, one, minus one, uh, then A, T, T transpose A, this, nothing but this. So this tells you, what does this tell you? This tells you that norms of vectors are preserved under a, not just norms, inner products, okay? So, um, so this is actually sort of, is our isometries 
um, off. So let me just say a preserve product. Um, and, um, uh, and so this is some special orthogonal group with the signature. And the fact that's interesting for us is that it acts transitively on the script H. So this will help us, um, for example, to show this because what we've shown is true for this point and this tangent space is actually true for all points, okay, because of this, okay? So how do you show it acts transitively? Well, let me write down um, two sort of three by three matrices. So one of them I'll call L sigma. So that's this cosine sine sine cosine. So this you might recognize, okay? So what are these matrices? These are just rotating in the x1, x2 sort of plane, okay? So these are sort of rotations. Certainly these rotations are, are elements of those isometries, okay? So, I mean, you could have seen this here also. I mean, this, this metric, I mean, so uh, it's actually rotationally invariant, but, but you, you can check that this takes this one, one, minus one to one, one, minus one. If you so, so these are uh, some elements. Uh, another more interesting elements in this group SO21 are these. I'll call them M row, and this is, looks like this. this is cinch row, zero, cross row. Okay? Um, yeah, and these are called boosts. Okay, and yeah, so these are these rotation and boost. So, so where does this take zero zero one? By the way, so the zero zero one goes to this, right? So it's cinch row zero cosh row. Okay, so this kind of translates this hyperboloid. So cinch row um, zero cosh row is another point in this hyperboloid. Okay, uh, so this this takes them there. Okay, I'm, I'm way over time, so let me just quickly end. So, so this, this actually tells you that you go everywhere. So if you want to reach a point, you kind of rotate so that you're kind of facing that point and then do a boost. Okay, so this way you can, this, this acts transitively. So this is a, indeed a Riemannian metric, and it turns out to be equal to the hyperbolic metric. So what's the relation with the other models that we considered? So... Um, so the relation with, let's say, the unit disk model, and I'll end, end here with a picture. Um, so, so here's the hyperboloid again. So this is an um, yeah. So here you have a hyperboloid somewhere here. So what you can do, you can sort of map it to the unit disk on this x1, x2 plane by projecting from a point 0, 0, minus 1. So if you look at the point 0, 0, minus 1, you take a point in script H, and you connect these two, it'll intersect the x1, x2 plane at some point. Okay, and this turns out to be identifying H with this unit disk D. So there's a, there's a map from H to D, we call it psi, and what it takes is x1, x2, x3 in H goes to, so it's, maybe it looks something like this. Okay, so, um, yeah, and this, uh, this turns out is, is an isometry. Okay, so we've already seen this, um, the Poincare metric, oh sorry, the hyperbolic metric on the unit disk. Right, and, and you've seen the, this metric I've described on H, which is induced by this uh, funny inner product, and and in this, this map psi is actually is defined by this projection is actually an isometry uh, from this metric to that, and that's again a calculation very similar to. So so this is another model of hyperbolic geometry, um, which is different. It kind of lives in 
instead of R3, but it's, it's useful, and you can go back and forth. So the disk and the upper half plane, you already know that you can go back and forth by that map that I uh, defined. And now by this projection, you can go back and forth between this uh, model and the uh, unit disk. And all of these are useful in hyperbolic geometry. I, I didn't uh, do uh, the other example of uh, a trigonometric identity uh, that you can easily compute in this model. It's harder to do in the other models. Anyway, so, uh, uh, so next time we'll see why hyperbolic geometry is important. It's, it turns out that you can get any surface as a quotient of the hyperbolic plane by isometries. Okay, so any surface of genus bigger than or equal to two, is, and and uh, and uh, that will play a role uh, in the next two lectures. Okay, thanks. Uh, sorry for going over there. Yes. I uh, said uh, that first term trace square a minus one. That one should be four and. In the second modulus, the trace square... Oh, so this is the, the exercise? No, sir, in mini-project. Oh, the mini-project. Yeah, theorem 1.1, 1 .1, that inequality. Ah, okay, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll discuss sir, this. Sir, otherwise the corollary won't follow. You see, uh, uh, keep anyone uh, near the identity. Yeah. Say A is identity or something near the identity, then it's anyway greater than 1, but maximum... Ah, okay, so maybe it has to be four. You're saying that instead of two, it has to be four, is it? No, sir. The first term, the one should be four, and in the second term, that should, shouldn't be any squared. That only trace. Trace AB. Okay, fine, fine, fine. All right, okay. Yeah, we will do that correction. Thanks. Yeah, so, yeah, so all of these, so these exercises, you can, you can kind of check and, uh, uh, you know, try yourselves and these mini projects that I've defined. Okay, so you can, so part of your mini project is to, is to correct all the typos, okay, so, um, yeah.